Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to GM Tips. I'm Satine Phoenix, co-creator of Maze Arcana and a dungeon master on Fury's Reach. Each player sits at your table for a reason, to play. But not all adventurers are created equal. I was at a table in Australia. No, Australia. About 10 years ago, where most of the players were adults who hadn't gamed in a really long time. We got together because we wanted to play with other intelligent adults who love puzzles. After the first session, it was clear. We really just wanted to kill things. We threw the GM's entire brain-bending campaign out the window. I felt bad because he spent so much time working on it. But that didn't seem to bother him. He crafted the rest of the adventure to the game we really wanted to play. Kill, kill, kill! Leaving us with only a few puzzles and riddles over the length of the campaign. He was able to read us fairly quickly, figuring out where our boundaries were and what kind of challenges would satisfy each of us. This brings us to today's theme, Know Your Audience. Tip number one, communicate. Not everything is as it seems. Some players have grand ideas of what they want in a game, and sometimes, once they get it, realize it was better in theory. I am incredibly guilty of this as a player, and you, as the fabulous game master you are, have taken your players' enthusiastic requests and built them the game of their dreams. After you've run them through the game, check in on them. Ask them what they liked about the game and what it was about that moment they liked so much. Listen to their answer. If they, like us, say they want a puzzle game, but had the most fun smashing bad guys, Try adjusting next time and blending bits of the elements they originally said they wanted into the combat they admitted to liking more. This isn't something that happens often, but what is good about this, as I often say, is communication. Maybe only in that space does your player feel safe telling you how they feel. Maybe they don't want to disappoint you or offend you by saying something. You won't know until you ask. Tip number two, altering tone. This tip is broken down into multiple legs. Leg A, environment. Where you play can affect the tone of your game. It can affect what and how you play, the things you say and how loud you say them. What kind of game and subject matter is reasonable at a public play space? You have to take things into consideration like the players at different tables around you. Are there kids nearby? Are you playing with people you didn't know well? In this environment, you may have to adjust your game to fit a more rated PG-13 atmosphere, AKA be careful who you're cursing around. Playing at yours or a friend's house, you have more freedom to intensify the tone of your game. Themes that might offend anyone outside of your group are safest played at home. Another way you can alter the tone is with sound, lighting, and NPC volume control. Leg B, themes. How familiar you are with your players can have an effect on the tone you choose to run your game. Are you playing with a group of adults who want to push their limits? Playing with new players who are adults. Playing with new players who are kids. Playing with kids you know, and playing with their friends who you don't know. Playing with friends who have definitive topics that are not to be crossed. Each of these groups have specific levels of play you'll have to adjust your game to. Asking what they're comfortable with is a good first step. Leg C, progressive tone change based on learning your players over time. Does one player get uncomfortable when you approach a topic or theme? Do they get quiet, stop participating at the table, or suddenly stop showing up? Sometimes you play with people who didn't realize what their boundaries were until they were pushed. If you notice someone withdrawing and they don't come to you directly about why, take them aside and gently ask them if there's something about the game that made them uncomfortable. If you put a theme into your game you know is a bit taboo, talk to your players ahead of time and let them know before you start playing. Tip number three, play well with others. We've talked a lot about it being your game because you're the GM, but part of being a good game master is being able to play with your players. Take the time to learn how they play their characters, the parts of the game they're drawn to, and the parts that quiet them. Listen to their comments and really hear them. There's no adventure without the players, so take what they like into consideration when making your campaign. I could roll on, but instead, let's discuss this with voice actor, director, and Vax from Critical Role, Liam O'Brien. Hello. Hello, and thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, in our pre-interview, we discussed knowing your audience. So we talked about outgoing versus introverts. 
Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so my experience DMing over the past couple of years has been with two sets of kids, my own children, started with my kids, and over the last year a little bit with the, with the players from Critical Role, so pretty wide spectrum there. Um, but what I've learned in my time uh, coming back to the DM uh, seat is it's a little bit like um, your first game is kind of like a first date. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's cert I think there's certain um, uh, habits that you bring to every game that you DM, but every group is totally different. And so starting on the first game and then more and more each game, uh, you learn about your audience, your players, and what they're like. And I mean, everyone's talked about how there's different kinds of players. Some people are more theatrical, some people are more number crunchy. Yeah. Um, and I think your first game or two or five is about figuring out what kind of player you have. So I DM for, I have a 10 year old boy and an eight year old girl. And uh, I started with my son and my daughter got curious as well. And they're totally, just like they are in life, they're totally different uh, players. My son is very shy and kind of unsure about role playing in general or has been. And my daughter is a big ham and cheese sandwich and <laughs> loves uh, goofing around. Cute. So um, I have two very, very different games running for the kids uh, based on, on the, the kinds of players and their groups that I've learned uh, them to be. My, my son and his group, all, both kids are, are extremely smart. <laughs> I'm a dad. Um, <laughs> Uh, my son's group is a little more uh, number crunchy. They like the, the battlefield and strategy and hiding behind a rock and you do this and I do that. You're yeah. the bottle cap, I'm the stick. Boys, yeah. Boys. <laughs> I, I thought that we would be more cerebral, my family in general, just because I'm such an egghead, but I was wrong. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, there, there is definitely role playing and over time I've kind of encouraged it. Uh, and, and my son has sort of blossomed in that sense because of the game, because it's the best game. Uh, while well, my daughter hit the ground running, they're all very, her group of eight-year-olds really like ambiance and mood, and I'm running Curse of Strahd for them, oh, and nice. they, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm standing down the edges for my audience, but um, uh, I, I've learned that they like solving puzzles, and they like spooky things, and they like, um, they, they're really into the story, yeah. whereas the boys just like, like their power fantasy of being big bulky dragonborns and blasting things out of the water. But you still give them a uh, story oh, in yeah. that too. Oh yeah, yeah. But do you find that they're kind of waiting for the next in like fighting encounter or do they enjoy the different uh, They like it too, but I'm I the 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 girls are sort of uh, always role playing and the boys kind of go go in waves and they they like they're obviously at their most excited when they're kicking something's ass or or when I'm having that thing kick their ass. A little bit, and I think that's, you know, I compare that even to the the handful of games I've run for my own group. You're you're choosing what you're trying to do with your group. No no group is is the same, and so I think it, part of the DM's job is to to cater to your to your your group at the time because you're playing with them, right? You're not right. playing at them. Yeah, you're not <laughs> not you're not bringing some sort of uh, hard and fast set in stone like religion archetype of the game yeah. and bow down and, and, and you know follow the religion. It's, you're getting a group together, you want them to have fun. I mean, it really is, it's catering, it's, it's, it's serving them. You have the boys group and you have the girls group and you know your son and your daughter, but how do you, how do you dungeon master the other kids who you don't know or do you feel like you're learning them as you go? Yeah, learning, definitely learning as you go. Uh, the vampire game, my daughter was adamant on doing Strahd, and <laughs> I'm, I'm doing you know this gothic, horrific, it, it can be, it's obviously not for them, uh, story, and I knew that I had to scale it down and scale it back, and uh, the beginning of that adventure, you go into Death House, it's just a house. It's not called Death House for them, but um, I had to sort of like fine tune just how creepy and scary it was. You know, they like Harry Potter, they like, they like telling each other ghost stories, but I also can't scare, I can't send them home with nightmares. So the first yeah. game or two was like, okay, I'm gonna dial it down. Nope, I need to dial it down even a little bit further because oh. one little girl in the group is even a little more sensitive than the others. And so it, it informed how much levity I needed to bring in to you know, feed them that vampire sandwich. How did you read that? Because that sounds like a very sensitive mm -hmm. thing to experience and also like not panic as an right. adult. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I mean, you're just, you're feeling it out in the room, and it really is building chemistry in the moment, and I could just tell, 
Uh, I mean, she let me know. She turned to her friends and said, ooh, this is a little scary. And I Aww. knew, like, all right, I need to turn the dial and make this voice a little goofier or, or a little less direct eye contact role playing yeah. with these little little kids. And they're eight. They're very smart eight-year-olds, but, you know, you, again, custom, custom built to the group you have. So in these games, you've dialed it back a bit mm -hmm. to cater to their sensitivities. Has there been a point where you ramp it back up because you feel that it's okay? And at what point is it okay for you to actually do that? Yeah, I mean, it comes with time, and they're they're growing up. <laughs> they're growing up as I run these games, and one of my intentions for both these groups and all these kids, and I know their families, and I know them really well now, is to help them um, learn problem solving and and teach them how to like like take ownership of their decisions and their decisions in life, and um, I'm watching them grow up and evolve. And my son's game is, is a little further out than my daughter's. I've been doing my son's almost twice as long. And when I started with the boys, when they were nine, they had just turned nine, it was very simple and very easy. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to TPK any of these kids at any time. But I also didn't want to, I wanted them to have happy memories of the, their beginnings with Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop gaming. So things were very simple and there was a lot of problem solving and there was never any real threat per se. There's not any threat yeah. now. But, um... <laughs> Smash cut to a year and a half later, I had the boys facing off against um, uh, a dragon, which which would cream them, right? But yeah. uh, he was just there to do some damage and leave, and I and I killed one. I killed one of the boys. I knew that there was <laughs> there was going to be a temple nearby. I knew that there was no no issue. But at the beginning of the game, I want them to feel safe and feel like just a sense of adventure and wonder, and get them to understand how with Dungeons and Dragons anything is. And, and all tabletop gaming, sky's the limit. There's no limit on your imagination. Yeah. Now that they're getting older and they're grappling with more, already a year later, grappling with more mature thoughts and, and, and life, I want them to have that adrenaline rush and go, oh my gosh, I could lose it all, and have that sense of accomplishment or victory when they've overcome the impossible, which, which they have. The girls are you know, six or eight months behind I won't be doing that for a while, yeah. uh, but I will eventually. <laughs> um, and it's been fascinating, just like you watch your kids grow up in general in life, to see them, you know, reading their first words and uh, graduating kindergarten. It's it's amazing to see these young minds um, becoming more layered and complex through this kind of storytelling. And you're helping. Because yeah. like the stuff that yeah. you're doing, um, run, the stories you're running them through, those are life lessons. Mm -hmm. It gives them the courage to make the choices they have to make in mm -hmm. impossible situations. I also remember being younger and having like one friend in particular, his dad was the cool dad, and I got introduced to uh, Japanese animation and comic books and robots and all this, all the, like Naushika. Uh, that Miyazaki film, which yeah. when I saw it, when it was in that one tiny theater, no one knew what it was. It was amazing. <laughs> and he, that guy opened my mind up to a lot of things, the things that just my parents weren't even aware of. And not that I'm imparting some like secret truth to these children, but I feel like I'm letting them through a doorway into Narnia for the first time. And I hope, you know, when they're 20, 30, 40, <laughs> they go, oh man, that kid's old man was so cool. <laughs> You're that cool set dad. me off on the road to, to all this. Yeah, maybe they can grow up to be voice actors mm -hmm. or entertainment folk. Mm -hmm. What does your pregame house rule look like? Uh, well, since most of my time is with the kids, I am reminding them every game that the purpose, obviously, is not to win and that they need to be constantly working together and lifting each other up. Uh, and just uh, I help them remember focus because everybody wants to be the hero all the time. So it's always, all right, remember, you're, this is your moment to shine, and now it's his, and now it's his. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. That's not just for kids. That's for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite GM moment? Uh, I will give you two, one from the kids, one from the grown-ups. My favorite uh, kid moment is my daughter. So proud of her. Uh, was playing a druid in a game that I do just for my son and daughter, and she used grasping vines to drag some fool into a bonfire nice. to waste him. So I was really <laughs> proud of her uh, little monster side. And then um, in my most recent one shot for Critical Role, I had them 
find uh, Liam O'Brien in a vat uh, in a dark oh. dystopian Los Angeles future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spoke in a speak and spell voice to them. Uh, and he said many things, but he also told them what they all meant to him. And it was something that I had been planning for about a uh, six months, eight months maybe. And I had thought of that moment first. And everything else in that game, which came before it, was built from that final moment. So eight months passing by to live on the internet, <laughs> uh, starting to sound like the War Games computer, uh, and watching their faces kind of break and nice. laugh and, <laughs> and then go you know, blank was, was amazing. It's what, it's what GMing's about. Yeah. Quick tip for the audience. I would say uh, my number one thing for GMs, uh, from my own experience, is to embrace uncertainty. Uh, I still have the urge to plan and over plan, and I never get to it all anyway, and it's not what my kids or I think any players remember. It's the little bit of magic, the mistakes, the, the unexpected twists uh, that happen by accident. That's our show for today. Thank you, Liam, for hanging out with us. Where can we find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me at Voice of O'Brien and Twitter, and uh, more importantly, every Thursday night on Critical Role. Here at Geek and Sundry. As always, I'm Satine Phoenix, at Satine Phoenix, and you can ask me questions with the hashtag AskSatine. You can watch more of these super fun GM tips on Geek and Sundry, and find me, as always, Sundays on Maze Arcana's Orphan Echo and Dungeon Mastering Fury's Reach with Rudy on twitch.tv slash dnd. Liam, would you please GM us out of here? You find yourself watching a YouTube video. You've lost track of time. Has it been minutes? Hours? Weeks of your life? And you find yourself wondering, have you been watching GM Tips? Or has GM Tips been watching you?